Thank you so much for Thank joining, you so me, for much for joining me for our Go With Your Gut presentation. Today we're going to discuss something that is very near and dear to my heart. We're going to talk about natural ways to treat neurological issues. My main focus is going to be on ADD, ADHD, and autism as it relates to, hope, to those, but I do hope that you'll find that this information applies to a lot of neurological and autoimmune issues. My name is Ashley Boyd, and I come to this from the perspective of a mother. I'm not a medical professional, and the information in this presentation isn't meant to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease, and it's not meant to replace professional medical advice. I simply want to share the knowledge and experiences that I've had over the last five years um, as we've dealt with my son's struggle with ADHD. It's basically just a compilation of everything that we have learned through our experiences, through extensive research, through the guidance of doctors, through medical testing, and through a great deal of prayer. And I don't want to discount that last one. It had, prayer has been foundational to, to us every step of the way. I also want to say that no one thing has been a fix-all for our son. It's really been like putting pieces of a puzzle together. And I just, I'm going to take you through the journey kind of as we went through it. So I hope I'm not jumping around too much, but I do hope that this is a blessing to you. So just to share a little bit of our story, our son began exhibiting symptoms of ADHD at around three years old. He's our firstborn, so we didn't have experience with kids before then, or not much anyways. And it was difficult to determine if his energy was abnormal or just a normal child at his age. But it was about three that we did start to notice um, some symptoms that were out of the ordinary. He was extremely hyperactive, more so than other kids his age, and his energy level was very sustained <laughs> over long periods of time. Um, I remember going to a pool party and watching him jump off the diving board and swim to the side, and jump off the diving board and swim to the side, and we had to make him get out of the pool to, to eat for like like 10 minutes, and then it, he did this for about seven straight hours, and he was five years old, five or six years old maybe. So we really did see that hyperactivity was something um, more so. He had more energy than anyone I'd ever met before in my life. He was also extremely impulsive. You could ask him not to do something, and he would immediately do it, and then have a look of regret as if he didn't really mean to do it. It was almost something he couldn't help but do. Now he was defiant at times too and he would do things on purpose that you asked him not to do but there was a difference with that impulsivity and we were really able to see that. Um, his preschool teacher also gave us some insight into how he was dealing with this at school. He tended to be overstimulated during transitions. She said that anytime the class were, was going to line up to go outside or to go to the gym he would end up in timeout. He just couldn't control himself in that kind of energetic environment. And that was really a red flag to me, I think, as far as realizing there was something that was going to affect him um, in socially and um, academically in class. He was also really small and underweight. And a lot of people don't think about this relating to ADD and ADHD, but I hope um, I'm going to shed some light on that later on in this presentation. But he had always been kind of small, but really as he turned three, I began being more concerned about his weight and um, the way that he was growing. I was really worried about his physical health at that time. He also had a lot of emotional meltdowns, and these were um, a little bit bigger, I think, than the regular three-year-old tantrums, and they lasted a long time. I mean, years, as in he would go, when he was four, five, even six, he still dealt with these where you it would take 45 minutes to calm him down. Um, it became extremely exhausting. And if you have a child that deals with this, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where you just want to be able to talk to them, to comfort them, to console them. And sometimes there's just nothing that you can do except give them time to um, come down off of that. But, um, but we did notice that it was an issue at school as well. His teachers, if there were two teachers in the classroom, it was one of them, it had to be full time on him almost to make sure that he was emotionally stable during class time. He also dealt with ticks, and I know this can be normal um, for some kids, but it was a little, his were a little bit excessive at times. And they went, they were cyclical. They would come for a while and then they would 
kind of go away and then they would come back. And so we really felt like there was something triggering them and we wanted to find out what that was. He did a lot of throat clearing um, and he even went through probably a year and a half of licking things, licking his hands, licking his shoulder, things like that. And other than that, he's, he's a normal kid. He's not, he wasn't a weird kid or an odd kid. He had a lot of friends, but he still did these things. And it was really um, an interesting thing. He was also a really poor sleeper. This, I think, was the kind of the front line of our battles with parenting. We would spend two hours trying to get him to sleep at night. Um, he wouldn't sleep well through the night. He would wake up with nightmares. He'd wet the bed. And pretty much every night when he was three and four years old, he would he would wake up in the middle of the night and end up in our bed. I became pregnant with our daughter when he was three. And so that be, that kind of, we, re, we were beginning to realize that we were having a newborn coming along. We needed to get him sleeping through the night. Plus, I know if, he, if he's not getting good sleep at night, then there's no way he's going to have um, good emotions the next day. There's no way that we can expect him to behave better if he's not getting good sleep. So that was really what I felt like the front lines of our battle were. This is kind of, now these symptoms are just kind of an overview of what we dealt with over several years. But um, when he was, when when I really felt like we hit a, a point that I had to, um, I had to find an answer. He was six years old. We had been homeschooling him for a little while. And we did a trial run in a classroom where I put him into a Christian school for just a few days. And we were kind of just testing it out to see how it was going to go. And um, on the third day, the director of the school called me to come pick him up early and said that he had had issues um, with other students. He was hitting. He was lashing out. He was a kindergartner at the time. He was being disrespectful to his teacher, which is something we really hadn't encountered before as far as being verbally disrespectful to other adults. He um, was just not controlling himself well or anything. And she told me that she didn't think it was a good fit for right now. And um, and she was very nice about it. And the teachers were all very kind. But it was a really hard thing for me. I know what it's like, and I've done it several times, to sit in a principal's office and just have them look at you and you feel judged. <laughs> you feel like you're doing something wrong. And I really had to go through a lot of prayer during that time, asking God to show me the truth in any of that. Am, are my, am I feeling that way because I worry about what other people think? Or is that really something true there that I'm not doing right as a parent? I think a lot of times we're not doing anything wrong. It's just part of the process. And God used that process in my life and in my son's life. But I remember holding him in that parking lot and talking to him and letting him know he wasn't going to go back to that school. And um, and he was upset. He loved being around other kids, and he was having a blast. As far as he knew, nothing was wrong. And um, and he was upset. He, he cried, and I cried. And it's just one of those moments where you go, I just want my kid to be able to function <laughs> in society and have friends and be with other kids. So you get to that point where you're really desperate to find answers. Um, the pressure that I felt from the schools to find an answer did lead me to research what modern medicine had to offer. I knew that I could very easily get a diagnosis of ADHD. I had letters from at least three teachers that would verify the issues that he had. I would sat in doctor's offices where doctors said, oh yeah, you could you could get a diagnosis. But the only purpose for a diagnosis is to get prescriptions for pharmaceutical drugs. And so I wanted to make sure that it was really a process that was even worth going through for us. So I began to do my research and I realized that stimulant drugs are what, it, what would most likely be um, prescribed to my son. And stimulant drugs are effectively a prescription form of methamphetamines. Um, if you're not familiar with methamphetamines and what that street drug is like, it's, it's pretty... Um, it's pretty awful, and um, and it has long-term health health effects. It damages your teeth, it damages your liver, it damages your kidneys, it um, messes majorly with your immune system and things like that. But the the prescription version is much less, of course. Um, it's not necessarily the amount that people are taking out on the street, but still, this is 
um, this is a drug that we're giving to our kids. And so I needed to learn a little bit more about it, about side effects and things like that. So when I looked into side effects, I realized that a lot of the side effects, poor appetite, weight loss, poor growth, sleep problems, irritability, tics, these things are, are issues we're already dealing with. So I'm going to give him a drug that is, that is a, you know, a, the same as speed or methamphetamines and, and then have the risks of that and maybe still deal with a lot of the same side effects. And I just didn't know that I was very comfortable with that. Some of the other statistics that are really just unsettling for me are the, um, are that this, there's a huge correlation between these types of meds and substance abuse later on in life. Um, and I just, I don't want to set my son up for that kind of thing. We're looking into growing a, um, a young man that God has great plans for. So I just wanted to make sure this was going to be part of God's plan for him. And I didn't feel like it was. I also saw that this was going to lead to eventual growth hormones because, um, because he was going to continue to lose weight and grow poorly. And so I, I could see kind of the cause and effect that would happen here. And then it was going to be a lifetime of prescription meds to function. And um, I've seen a lot of people that I know personally who have who have done this throughout their life, throughout their childhood, and I've not met anyone that it has helped significantly enough for me to weigh the risks. And that was that was kind of the conclusion that we came to for our family. That it just I believe that there is a time and place for modern medicine. I'm not anti doctors at all, but I just didn't feel like in through prayer we we felt like modern medicine was not going to be a part of our solution. What I did begin learning in this research process is how to be an advocate for my child. I learned to advocate to him, to God, first off, and I don't think I've ever prayed so diligently for anything in my life as I have over my son and constantly seeking direction for what steps we needed to take for him. The truth is, is that God is the only one that cares more for your child and knows him better than you. So advocating to God is just number one there. But here on earth, no one cares more about your child and knows your situation better than you. So you have to remember that. But I did learn to advocate for my child educationally. I talked about sitting in principal's offices and things like that. But And the pressure of the educational system is to find a quick solution. Um, because of that, we chose to homeschool him for a few years. But once he was back in school, I'm, I was up front with his teachers at the beginning of the year saying, these are the issues we deal with and here's what the steps that we've taken. And I tell them not to be afraid to email me if he seems unusually energetic or unusually calm because we want to know if what we're doing is working well or if something is, is setting him off, you know, the wrong direction. And we're always trying different things. And teachers can really give you some great insight into what is and isn't working for your child. So it's so important to build a he healthy relationship with your, your child's teacher if they're in a public school and or private school. And thankfully, we've been so blessed with teachers, just wonderful teachers for our son, teachers that loved him, even when he was really, really difficult to have in class. And they cared about his future. And they they we're very understanding and loving of him. And I think that makes the whole thing so much easier to deal with as a parent. It's also very important to do your research on any aspect, any drug, any therapy, anything. Just look up the good, the bad, the ugly. Talk to other people that have done it. Um, I, I, I've asked everybody, anybody I know who has a kid with ADD, ADHD, I feel like I've talked to them. And I, I asked medical professionals if Someone gave me an opinion, a, a doctor gave me an opinion. I wanted to ask another doctor. I wanted a second opinion. I wanted to um, really seek out our options. And research is, is just foundational to that. This next one is kind of hard for some people, but question everything. If a doctor or a therapist recommends something, ask questions. You need to understand exactly why they want to do that and how they expect it to work for your child. And if it, because if it isn't working, then you can say, we don't want to do this anymore. This isn't working for us. And don't be afraid to do that. You know your child better than anyone else. And your mommy gut is extremely important. So go with it. Don't be afraid to say this isn't for us. This isn't what we want to do. In the beginning of all of this, I really expected somebody to hold my hand through this process. I expected our pediatrician to come along and say, okay, I'm and just tell me what to do. And I was going to follow her guidance. 
and we were going to fix it. And we have a great, wonderful, holistic pediatrician. She comes highly recommended, and she's an expert on natural health and nutrition, but she's a busy lady. So she made a few recommendations, but she doesn't see him every day. She might see him once every few months when we were really going through this process. She doesn't remember everything that we're doing and everything that we've already tried and everything that I've already told her. So I really had to learn to be an advocate for him to his doctors, to research and bring up different options and to request specific things if I felt like he needed them. So this really led me to the first thing that I tried, which was chiropractics. Chiropractors are a wealth of knowledge and, and information on nutrition and how the body works. There are kind of two branches of chiropractics. There are the sports medicine chiropractors who deal more with injuries and things like that. And then there are the wellness chiropractors. They are holistic healthcare providers. And those are the kind of chiropractors that I'm talking about here. My first experience with chiropractics is when I was pregnant with my daughter. My midwife required me to see a chiropractor regularly throughout my entire pregnancy. And I learned a lot about nutrition from him, but I also learned I could go in and he could feel of my spine and tell me what symptoms I was having that week. He was like, oh, are you experiencing heartburn? I was like, yeah, how did you know? He said, well, you've got an area out here. And what I learned is that nerves are the communication highways of our body. If you look at the little chart here, you can see kind of in the spine where the nerves are kind of branch out to different organs and systems in our body. So if we have uh, pressure from our spine in any, or subluxations in any of, of those areas, it puts pressure on those nerves and it can disrupt the communication to our brain or from our brain to those areas. So if I had an area out around my esophagus and, and things like that that contain those nerves, then I might deal with more heartburn that month. And so that was really, really enlightening to me. And I loved chiropractics. I fell in love with them at that time. So I decided to give this a try for our son. He was four years old when we first took him. And yes, there are chiropractors that, that deal with kids of all ages, including newborns. Our family chiropractor now does. And, um, and it's really interesting to see them work and see them explain to you how the body works. When we first took our son, he had some areas off in the top of his spine that were right at the base of his brainstem. And what I learned was having subluxations in that area can make a huge impact on emotion, on energy levels, on, on, all, on nightmares and things like that that he was dealing with at night. He also had a lot jumbled up kind of down at the bottom, the base of his spine. And that was an area that is going to deal with his bladder and his digestive system. So our chiropractor said he could just not be getting that signal strong enough to his brain to wake him up at night to go to the bathroom. So what we found was chiropractics, within a month of doing chiropractics, he was sleeping through the night. Literally, like every night, sleeping through the night. And it also became easier to get him to go to sleep. Instead of a two-hour battle, it was now a 30-minute battle which was really huge for us. So that was kind of the first big step for us. And something else that I learned, I think that it was just God that we did this first because it really paved the way. Getting his spine aligned and making sure there was proper communication in his nervous system is, is what he needed for healing, growing, detoxing, digestion, for, uh, for anything that we were going to try later on to be more successful, we needed his spine to be right and aligned. Occupational and brain therapies are a huge thing right now for kids with ADD and ADHD and autism and any other neurological issues. And what they are intended to do is stimulate the areas of the brain that aren't as active. Um, a lot of these kids have inactive areas or areas that aren't as active and, they, and there's belief that and evidence to prove that that's what causes um, a lot of their issues. So the, the specific therapy that we did was called interactive metronome therapy. And it had to do with, he had to clap a lot to certain beats and certain rhythms, um, play games and do things on the beat and rhythm. And the idea was to kind of get that internal pacing down. 
and really waken up, wake, awaken those areas of the brain. Brain balance therapies work in a similar way to, re, to activate right brain or left brain and doing different things at different times. Electrotherapy stimulation does the same thing. Neuromapping and neurofeedback actually take a map of the brain to show you which areas are energized and which areas aren't, um, aren't as active. Memory training and sensory motor activities, all of these work in a similar way. I will tell you that interactive metronome therapy worked uh, to help our son with impulsivity. I think it helped him some with emotional control, but it wasn't an answer for everything. Um, that, that chiropractor there also wanted him to do amino acid supplementation, which I'm going to talk about right So one of the things that I learned at the therapy sessions is how the brain works. The brain uses amino acids to create neurotransmitters, and these transmitters carry information. So basically, they're how the brain communicates with itself. Receptors take in the neurotransmitters. So we have amino acids. They create neurotransmitters. And then we have receptors that take in this information, process the information. But these receptors can be clogged or broken down by toxins. So the therapies work to create new neurological pathways or synapses for the neurotransmitters. The more a synapse is used, the stronger that pathway becomes. So this is how we build and break habits just naturally as humans. But the brain therapies are a great way to guide our kids to build those new habits. Now, what his chiropractor wanted us to do was do amino acid supplementation. Because he had certain receptors that weren't effectively working, he wanted to increase the neurotransmitters in our son's brain through by giving him a bunch of amino acids. Well, our son was five years old at the time, and he was taking about 15 capsules a day of amino acid supplementation. That was a challenge, <laughs> to say the least. Um, not only that, but because he was so young and would progress so quickly, the levels of amino acid had to be adjusted constantly. And we found ourselves on a roller coaster that was worse than anything else we had dealt with prior. So I talked to his chiropractor and I said, what, you know, is this, are the amino acids making it more effective? And he said, no. The only thing the amino acids are doing is kind of bridging the gap from where we are now to where we want to be. The amino acids can kind of give us those extra neurotransmitters until those, those receptors are healed and new synapses are, are built and created. So I requested and advocated for my son that we stop the amino acid supplementation. I would rather see him steadily grow and go up than to go up and down and up and down and never know what to expect. And so for us, that was something that we we really prayed about, and I think it was a good decision for us. But learning about that was foundational for some of the other things that I was going to learn later on, um, just about neurological pathways and amino acids and things like that. It was about this time that we also began um, making some basic dietary changes. Uh, our son was about six when we were kind of going through this, and he had gained about three pounds over the last two years. And I was really getting more concerned about his growth. So it was about this time I, I decided that we were going to really make some diet changes. I started to read the ingredients and everything. And um, what we decided to eliminate were things like high fructose corn syrup, which is linked to a lot of issues, including hyperactivity. Artificial colors, red dye 40, yellow 5. A lot of those are linked to hyperactivity. Artificial flavors, artificial sweeteners like Splenda and um, Sweet and Low, things like that, they are actually, they are actually going to clear out your good bowel flora, which we'll talk about more in a minute, and they're going to create an acidic environment. Artificial sweeteners are awful, awful. Do not let your kids have artificial sweeteners and limit sugar. So this was kind of the first thing that we, we tried was just to start paying more attention to this kind of stuff. And these are changes that almost any pediatrician, and not even a holistic pediatrician, would recommend for a child with ADHD. Some of the some things I also began researching at this time is how food sens sensitivities can cause ADHD symptoms. The most common ones um, are dairy and gluten. The idea at this time of cutting those 
was really daunting to me, um, especially since I didn't have any guarantee that it would help. I didn't know for sure if my son was sensitive to dairy or gluten. So what I did was I decided to make the switch to raw milk and we did organic sprouted grains whenever possible. Um, so th those were kind of some of the first changes that we made. A book that really helped me along in this process of the, these first few changes is called Special Needs Kids Eat Right by Judy Converse. I'll have all of these books that I talk about listed at the end as well. But this book recommended three lab tests that would really give an overview of your child's nutritional needs. So the three tests we requested from his pediatrician were the IgG food antibody test, which is designed to reveal food sensitivities by checking for antibodies built up in the blood to certain foods. The great thing about this is it keeps you from having to do the trial and error diet. It will show you in a blood test what you're sensitive to. Um, he didn't have anything major show up, although gluten was in the very low antibody category. Since doing this, I've learned that these tests can be really subjective to what you've eaten recently, um, and it can miss food sensitivities. I know people that have had a lot of success with muscle testing for food sensitivities, so that's another option um, other than doing the blood test. The second test we did was a comprehensive stool analysis. Now, let me tell you, <laughs> getting a stool sample from a six-year-old is interesting. <laughs> he laughed so hard at me for the idea of, of catching his poop in a bowl. So, <laughs> but the benefits of this test are that it can tell you, um, it can tell you about par if you have any parasites. It can also give you an idea of your bowel flora. Um, that's the good and bad bacteria you may have in your bowel. The test didn't reveal any major parasites for us, but he did have an overgrowth of a certain type of yeast, which was an interesting thing to learn and something that we had to take into consideration. The final test is the one that I found the most informative. It was the Nutraval FMV test. It was able to tell us what vitamins and minerals that our son was deficient in and how he was processing nutrients. What we discovered was that he was lacking in B vitamins and other antioxidants, which help process toxins. So that makes sense. If he has, if he's not processing toxins well, then they're going into his system and can cause those neuroreceptors to break down and things like that. And he also wasn't processing protein very well. His doctor recommended that he take an enzyme whenever he ate, he ate protein and a high antioxidant vitamin supplement. I found the fact that protein was an issue for my son really interesting. In my nutritional research, I had learned that protein is a building block for growth. Most of us know that. But it also breaks down into amino acids. So if you remember, amino acids become neurotransmitters, right? So I felt like this was starting to put a lot of the pieces together about why amino acid, maybe my son was lacking in amino acids or um, or why he wasn't his brain wasn't communicating well. So I really thought that this was a, a big part. I began at the supplements that were recommended, but I still wanted to understand why he wasn't creating enzymes on his own or not enough enzymes or the right kind of enzymes. So I turned to a book called Gut and Psychology Syndrome by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. I highly recommend this book for anyone with neurological or gut issues. Either or both, it doesn't matter. This book changed our life. It was really the, the book that put all the pieces together for us. So this is when I began to really research gut health and the importance of gut health. What I learned is that the gut is a primary part of our immune system. It is where our body processes toxins, where it um, eliminates waste. If we have backup of waste in our gut, then we can be leaking toxins into our system. There are also trillions of microorganisms that work symbiotically in our systems, good organisms that live in our systems and help keep us healthy, probiotics, right? So we think about that. Those are our words that we know of, but that's what they do in our system. If you can see kind of a really basic diagram of the intestinal lining. And I'm gonna try not to use any, I don't know all the scientific terms, but the little fingers on the inside of our, our digestive system, they work to trap food. And if you can see the digestive food inside your intestine, the toxins are going through and the nutrients go in through our, our um, intestinal lining. So that's the idea. That's how our intestines are supposed to work. They clear the toxins out and they take the nutrients in. 
are these little guys. They're introcytes, and aren't they cute? I love this little graphic. But basically, these introcytes sit on, you know, in rows along those little fingers of our digestive system, and they, on their hairs, catch digestive enzymes. Now, if our health, if our introcytes are sick and not doing well, then you can see their hair is kind of thin and weak and all of that stuff. And I just love that graphic for explaining that. But what happens? Here's an scientific. Um, but what happens? with that is when those introcytes aren't working well or they're missing, then those finger areas of our digestive system can become broken down. They can become inflamed. And what happens is instead of nutrients flowing in through our digestive system and to our brain, here you can see kind of the pathways to our brain and how it's, there's a lot of scientific terms on here. But anyways, instead of it sending nutrients to our brain, it sends toxins to our brain. Uh, this is really huge for kids with neurological issues. The neurological issues almost always stem from gut damage. So we're going to talk about toxins now. Okay, so toxins, what are they and what does that really mean? What toxins are, is there anything in our system that creates free radicals? And these free radicals can damage our systems. A lot of times we hear free radicals in a correlation to cancer and things like that. They can do that too, but they can also just clog your neuroreceptors and break them down. They can damage your gut. Um, and the problem is, is that toxins are everywhere. They're in our food, they're in our cleaning products, they're in cosmetics, they're in medications. And when I really kind of got to this conclusion, okay, my son is not processing toxins well, and they're everywhere, so what can I do? I began making my own cleaning products. I began um, researching different things that were in our medications and stopped using over-the-counter medications as much as possible. This is where I really became more interested in essential oils and how to use those instead to replace the toxic things that I was using in my household. Um, food, I began to buy organic whenever possible. Okay, so how does all of this cause gut damage? Well, if we want to talk about medications first, antibiotics are huge here. Antibiotics kill good and bad bacteria. So that can cause an imbalance in your bowel flora. We have good bacteria there that works in our system symbiotically keeping bad bacteria at bay, keeping our intestines a um, an inhospitable place for parasites, keeping yeast in check. Yeast is good. We want to have some of it, but overgrowth can cause a lot of problems. So having good bacteria in our system is extremely important to our health. But what happens is when we get bad bacteria in, it... Um, it makes us sick or whatever. We take antibiotics. It kills the good and bad bacteria. And then we have a system that is more hospitable to more bad bacteria. So probiotics are extremely important to take anytime you take antibiotics. And I didn't know this when my son was young. He was on several rounds of antibiotics early on, very early on in his life. He had a lot of ear infections um, in his first two years of life. And I think a lot of that ha probably had to do with some of the issues we deal with now. Vaccines can also cause gastrointestinal damage. I am, I am not anti-vaccines. I believe that it's important for you to do your research and decide what is best for your family. There are risks to vaccinating and there are risks to not vaccinating. So that's something that is between you and God and your family. So I'm, I'm not here to tell you that vaccines are awful. I think that sometimes if we introduce a vaccine into a system that already has a damaged gut, then it is only going to increase the problems. It'll increase the inflammation. It can The toxins that are in vaccines are going to be able to go um, straight through our gut and into our brain and things like that. It's, it's really something that you have to be prayerful about. Um, and then these things just become a vicious cycle. You're on antibiotics, clears out your gut, your gut becomes inflamed, you end up with allergies. Maybe it's food allergies or seasonal allergies, so you're taking medications for those things. You, you have GERD, you have leaky gut, which means your gut is releasing toxins back into your system instead of 
clearing them out like it's supposed to. When you have a toxic system, you're going to get sick more often. Then you're going to take more antibiotics. Then you're going to, and you see this system happening over and over again with people that are constantly chronically ill. So healing your gut is key to health for anyone. But the damage to the gut really leads to food and seasonal allergies, which we've talked to, but poor growth, encephalitis, which is brain inflammation. So that's really where we get to, this is this is all connected. The gut and the brain um, work together. And the way that our bodies is cr- are created is so incredible to me. But um, anyways, this kind of, for me, was foundational to what really helped our son the most. It's been our mission for the last a couple of years, uh, gut and psychology syndrome, which I mentioned before by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, it has been incredible. And she lays out a plan for gut healing that is um, very, very helpful. It's intense, but if you're dealing with a lot of health issues related to your gut, food allergies, food sensitivities, poor growth, it's worth it. And um, her her ideas are based on using nutrition to heal your gut, bone broths, building good bacteria through fermented foods, and then gradual reintroduction of foods. So you basically take away everything except the most nourishing of foods and the most, uh, the foods that are going to be the easiest to digest. And then you slowly add in other things over the course of several years. We didn't do the full GAPS protocol. Um, there were some other things that I read in a book called Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, which talks a lot about how our bodies process foods and the diet of traditional cultures. And um, a lot, the whole first half of the book, it's really a a recipe book, but the first half of the book reads like um, a textbook for nutrition. And one of the things that I read in there is how grains break down, um, break, inhibit enzymes. (laughs) And so I, that to me was a big red flag because we know that enzymes were an issue for our son. So I decided to do um, kind of a modified GAPS protocol. Really, we do modified paleo. And we went on a completely grain-free diet for about four to six weeks. And then we slowly reintroduced uh, rice that we eat occasionally. And we will eat occasionally uh, organic corn. But for the most part, we are on a paleo gluten-free diet. And that has been huge. Um, the, the difference that we've seen in our son from this has probably been bigger than anything else. Uh, diet has been foundational. And I know that doctors tell you that, nutritionists tell you that, but until you see it in your own child, you don't really believe it. So um, for us, that has been the foundation of, of really healing and working toward that. We also do supplementation though. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, I want to talk about some other things um, that have to do with healing your gut. Sometimes we do have to deal with parasites. And I know parasites seem like a really uh, something that's non-American that we don't deal with in this country. We It's only third world country issue. But it's estimated that 90% of Americans have at least one kind of parasite. Not only that, but in, invasive candida is a huge issue for a lot of people. Um, and that's a parasite issue as well. Um, some of the symptoms of invasive candida are leaky gut, food and seasonal allergies, migraines, depression, anxiety, bloating, constipation, autoimmune issues, brain fog, eczema, psoriasis, recurring UTIs, vaginal infections, those kinds of things. Um, that's, and I know several people that have dealt with, um, invasive candida and gone on certain protocols to deal with that. But A lot of times kids with neurological issues deal with this stuff in their gut because their gut is damaged. So if their gut is damaged and their bowel flora isn't healthy, then it's making the environment friendly for these kinds of things. Remember I said I did find out that my son had an overgrowth of candida um, of a certain type. And so this, though we didn't deal with parasites, we did deal with candida. So a good parasite protocol that you can try, something that's really simple is Okatea, which is one of my favorite oils, but one drop of Okatea in an eight ounce glass of water every day 
um, has been proven to get rid of parasites and candida. What they did was there were 88 children tested at a Young Living school in Ecuador. 66 of them had parasites and 22 had parasites and candida. The children were given the one drop of oil and water every day and Okatea was diffused in the classrooms. The Okatea killed both the parasites and candida which is pretty incredible. So that that's a really great option. Okatea has a nice cinnamon flavor. It's a diff, it's a type of cinnamon. And uh, so most kids really like it. Another option, especially if you have older children, is Parafree, which is a supplement that was created specifically for ridding the body of parasites. So if your child's old enough to swallow capsules or if you're an adult wanting to do a parasite cleanse, this is a really good option. So there are several supplements that we do daily, and I want to talk about the ones that work for us and that we do and why we do them. The first one that we do is a magnesium supplement supplement called Nature Calm. Um, that's the brand that we use. I'm sure there are other great options for magnesium supplementation. Um, the reason why we started this and the first thing that tipped me off to magnesium deficiency is I read somewhere about magnesium deficiency being a cause of extended morning sickness and pregnancy. Well, I spent the first seven months of both of my pregnancies very sick. I had morning sickness, night sickness, afternoon sickness, and lost, you know, my first trimester, I think I lost about 15 pounds both times. And then I gained all my weight for both of my pregnancies in the last two months because I was finally able to eat something. Um, so when I read that information, I kind of just stored it at the back of my mind and thought, oh, well, if we have another one, I'll remember to supplement with magnesium. That's probably an issue that I have. And of course, as God does, he starts to bring up other things that are talking about magnesium. And I began to read a lot about magnesium, what magnesium deficiency looks like. And one of the things that I learned is that magnesium is key to enzyme production. Now, we did the full nutritional testing on our son, and magnesium didn't show up to be deficient. He didn't show up to be deficient in magnesium, but only 1% of magnesium is in the blood. So if he, he could very well be deficient and it wouldn't show up in a blood in a, in a blood sample. So some of the symptoms of magnesium deficiency are muscle cramps, anxiety, insomnia, hyperactivity, high blood pressure, brain fog, kidney stones, osteoporosis. Because in case you don't know, magnesium and calcium work together. You, if you take calcium without magnesium, it is not absorbing into your system. You need to always take calcium and magnesium together. Epilepsy, MS, migraines. There were so many things that I read about magnesium that tipped me off that it might be an issue for our son and for me that I decided to just try it. And it's been huge. I remember the first week of giving him the magnesium supplement, he slept. He went to sleep like in five minutes of laying down. If you remember the, the days of two hours to try to get him to sleep and here we were giving him this, you know, fizzy drink is what we call it at night and he was he was going to sleep easily. It was really incredible. And um, magnesium has been something that we make sure that we do um, regularly every night. It is part of our protocol. It also is a great way to keep your digestive system going well. Magnesium, as you know, um, keeps your bowels moving. So it's very helpful in that as well, especially when you're doing paleo and no grains. Sometimes things can get a little stopped up. So it's helped us there as well. The next thing that I want to talk about is fermented cod liver oil. We use fermented cod liver oil from green pastures. Most of you have probably heard that omega-3s are great for kids that have uh, ADHD, neuro any neurological issues, but it's really important to make sure that your omega-3s are from a food source. And from and cod liver cod livers have been a food source of omega-3s for centuries. And the fermentation of the oil actually allows the nutrients to be more stable and it doesn't break them down like heating the oil does. So that's why fermented cod liver oil is, is just really, really special. We get ours from green pastures and we use the Oslo orange flavor. Um, my kids do it in their ninja red, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, it has omega-3s, has naturally occurring vitamin A and D and K. It's anti-inflammatory. It's healing to the gut and it helps the absorption of magnesium. So what we're really starting to see here is how the supplements that we're taking are working together to enhance one another and enhance healing. The next thing we do daily is the Ningja Red. This is a Young Living high antioxidant supplement. 
this is, remember his pediatrician had recommended he take a high antioxidant supplement and wolf berries or goji berries are um, the most, the highest antioxidant um, fruit that has been found, you know, on the earth so far. So that seemed like a great option for me. It's great um, for oxidizing the blood. It also contains L-glutamine, which is gut healing. L-glutamine is also foundational for growth hormones. So this is something I just learned in doing research for this, um, for this presentation. Uh, I, I didn't know that about L-glutamine. So it's, again, God has us doing ninja red and we can see the benefits of it, but it's helping in ways that we didn't even know. It also boosts the immune system and it increases mental energy. So we do the ninja red in a one ounce little glass every night. And we do, we put the fermented cod liver oil in it so that, um, and they flavor one another nicely so that you're not getting too much of a fish, fishy taste. And our kids love it. We call it their power shot. <laughs> so as we talked about enzymes being really important, uh, Young Living does have a kid's en digestive enzyme called Mightyzyme. There is also an enzyme called Sulfurzyme, which contains wolf berries, and it is a capsule, and I've had my son take that as well. Um, enzymes are very healing to the gut, and of course, they do help your body break down um, proteins and things like that. So I feel like we're on the road to healing, but when we do cheat and eat grains, which we do, I make sure that we take digestive enzymes. Another thing is probiotics. I have honestly not been as good about this as I should be, but Young Living has a great probiotic called Life 5. It, it is a capsule, but you can um, open it up and put it in uh, juice or on food or anything like that, so that you're, or in a smoothie, so that your kids can take it if they can't take a capsule. But some other options for probiotics are fermented vegetables and foods, making your own kefir or yogurt at home. NourishKitchen.com has some great um tutorial videos on how to do that and how to make fermented vegetables. I haven't gotten really super into it, but I have made my own kombucha and we drink kombucha every day, which is a great fermented beverage. And uh, it's great for kids. It's great for building up that gut flora, that bowel flora, that good bacteria naturally through food. Now I want to talk a little bit about essential oils that we've used. Essential oils have not been foundational to our protocol. They have been more of the icing on the cake. They help us in times when we need something specific for some, for a reason. And, um, and so I did want to just say that, that I, I feel like nutrition is the foundation and essential oils are more of the icing. So the oils that we use for mood and we found really effective, the first one was peace and calming. Um, peace and calming calms and relaxes some kids. Uh, others, it can be energizing. As you know, kids with ADD and ADHD tend to be energized by things that knock others out, and they tend to be relaxed and calm, made calm by things that energize others. So their brains work a little bit backwards. So I haven't found it to be extremely calming to my, uh, to my son, but we did find that it has an awesome effect on him for anxiety. I didn't realize anxiety was something that he really dealt with much, until uh, he got to where he was, he would say that he just felt weird. And this is, he's probably five or six years old. He started vocalizing more how he was feeling. He'd be like, I just feel weird. My, if, if I feel weird in my tummy. And I thought, well, are you sick? Does your stomach hurt? Are you hungry? And those are the questions, do you need to go to the bathroom? Those are the questions that we ask as moms. But really um, what he was dealing with was anxiety. And when I figured that out, I had, I said, here, try this. And just had him sniff a bottle of peace and calming and he said it went away immediately. So that has been something that is our go-to in the evening when he's in his room and it's dark, he's feeling kind of anxious, or if he has something new and exciting happening, just peace and calming, I really feel like helps um, calm those nerves a little bit. Another one, which is one of my favorite oils personally for myself, is Valor. Valor balances the nervous system and it reduces anxiety, anxiety as well. But what it does is it can balance your system even your hormonal system, so that you just feel more at peace and more at ease. I know that I have dealt with um, hitting that wall emotionally where you can't make a decision because of hormones or whatever else is going on in our heads. And 
I just, if I put some Valor on my wrists and put them together, take a few deep breaths, it really clears that brain fog and allows me to think clearly. And, um, and so Valor has been foundational that we use it for, um, for our son all the time. Another thing that it does that's really helpful is it allows better absorption of other oils. It really prepares the nervous system to accept other things. So again, it's also been called chiropractor in a, in a bottle. We talked about this with chiropractics that if your system is lined up and working properly, then it's going to allow everything else to be more effective. So Valor is able to do that for us in between our chiropractic visits. Um, lavender has been another thing. It's great for relaxing, awesome for sleep. We use it um, on our son at night to help him sleep better and stay asleep. And it's just been a really great one overall. We love it for allergies and things like that too. Um, this is kind of where we really get in more into healing the brain. Once we have taken care of the gut and the toxins going into our brain and into our system, then we can start to think about um, healing the brain and healing the inflammation there. So that's where we are in ours in our process. And what we what I've learned is that oils high and sesquiterpenes or sesquiterpenes that's what it is that's how you pronounce that sesquiterpenes I just learned that because I've always just read it and had to look up how to pronounce it correctly but oils high in sesquiterpenes are um are antiseptic and anti-inflammatory and they can cross the blood brain barrier so what they do is they go in and they increase oxygen around the pineal and the pituitary glands which creates serotonin and dopamine and all of those wonderful neurotransmitters that our brains need to communicate to one another. So it's incredible because what it does is these oils are actually able to go in, reduce inflammation in the brain, clear off receptors, and and build those neuro those neural pathways, those synapses back up for us. Frankincense is one of these oils that are high in se sesquiterpenes, cedarwood. Copaiba is awesome for inflammation. It's one of my favorite oils. It's one that I um, add to our mix um, every day. And it is, the, it is the one that is known for clearing off those toxic residues on receptor sites. Cedarwood can clear off um, cal calcification over the pituitary gland. Vetiver is well known for its help with focus and mental energy. Um, and ADHD, so, and ADD. Two others that I haven't used personally, but I know other people have had great success with are sandalwood and German chamomile. So those might be great options for you as well. Our blend looks like this. I've taken copaiba, cedarwood, vetiver, added a, a tad bit of coconut oil, put it in a roller bottle, and my son applies valor to his brain stem and to his wrists, takes a few deep breaths, and then he rolls that um, mixture onto the back of his neck every day. And we really, when he's on top of this and he has his supplements and we really have seen such a huge, huge improvement. So the books that I've talked about, um, you can see this is Special Needs Kids Eat Right by Judy Converse, um, Gut and Psychology Syndrome by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, Nourishing Tradi Traditions by Sally Fallon, and then the essential oils desk reference really gives a lot of insight into different oils and supplements and how they work in our system. So just to talk a little bit about where we are now, there's my family. Um, my son is in a public school right now. He is doing extremely, extremely well. He is, um, we're seeing constant progress with him, not only academically, which he's very, very smart. He just has a hard time staying focused sometimes. <laughs> But um, he loves school. He loves being around other kids. He's enjoying it. He is um, really thriving. And I think it's been so exciting to see that we didn't have to use medication, pharmaceuticals, for that to happen. We were able to find the, the things that he really needed um, and give them to him. It was a lot of big changes for our family, but we did them all together. We went grain-free together. We... Um, we don't go out and eat things and, that he's not allowed to have. So it's really been something that we came together as a family and did. And I have just felt so blessed about through this entire process. And I hope that you've been blessed by me sharing my story. So thank you so much for joining me for this. I do hope to continue to have continuing education videos uh, over the next few months and years. But you can check us out on Facebook 
at Anointed Living for Life, or you can check me out online at www.anointedliving.net. Thanks.